Hello, Jeffrey Fox here again. Lesson 13, Unit 2, Section 1, Big Data Applications Analytics Course, School of Informatics and Computing Data Science. And we're looking at cloud applications, not in the dominant commercial world where, where most of the computing gets done, but in research, which is important at least to me. and. Um, and it has a lot of implications, and this is part of the course motivation unit. All right, let's look at how scientific computing gets done. So we have various forms of scientific computing. We have large scale supercomputers, Blue Waters at NCSA Illinois is a good example of that. These come often now with GPUs. They run highly parallel simulations, maybe they're up to uh, a million cores or so. And uh, they have customized networks, <coughs> no latency, high bandwidth networks. They have, of course, multi core nodes. And <coughs> those take a few jobs, decompose them over the supercomputer, and do large scale parallel computing. The so called high throughput systems, which do what uh, we will sometimes called pleasingly parallel jobs largely. Uh, this is uh, what used to be called the European Grid Initiative in the US, the Open Science Grid. And they can often um, do cycle sealing, whip off to a, to a largely idle machine and find spare cycles on it. And the analysis of the Large Hadron Collider is a very good example of how this is done. And as I mentioned, this, this uses hundreds of thousands of cores around the world to do their analysis. Then we have grids. Grids, uh, uh, by definition, distributed uh, systems. They take resources, such as those of OSG and EGI across the world, and federate them together to, a, to be able to be, harness multiple computers to solve. Not a closely covered parallel job, but typically lots of jobs with a similar goal, just as lots of jobs analyzing data from the Large Hadron Collider, which data can be typically the detailed compute intensive analysis is largely independent. Everything in the world uses services, both commercially and in science, and typically software as a service is used, although it may not be advertised according to that fashion. <coughs> Another key idea is portals, which is the where you access these machines, you typically build a portal to access it. And we have workflow, which integrates uh, lots of processes into a single job. And you often, typically always have workflow. In any commercial job or any science job, workflow is almost universal. It's sometimes called orchestration. But whatever its name, it certainly uh, is uh, used a lot. All right. Now let's see how clouds fit in. So HPC systems have the lowest uh, synchronization cost and the highest communication capability. Grids have the worst, because <coughs> grids are typically distributed over the world. So they have um, long delays just from the communication time. Clouds are in between. Uh, they, may, they may or may not be distributed. But in any case, the virtualizations that they tend to use, and the fact they are virtualized, namely whether or not they use hypervisors, virtualization makes it difficult to keep nodes together. And remember that the node is next to each other, which is key in high performance computing. To get good performance, you exploit the locality of the system. So the there is a sort of hierarchy grid, so there's are the least couple, then clouds, and then classic HP systems. So this says that clouds can do grid workloads. <coughs> In particular, they can do the uh, Large Hadron Collider analysis. However, uh, they're not so clear for closely coupled HPC applications. Although many people are working on making clouds more effective. There's technologies like SRIOV, which allow you to uh, remove the synchronization overhead. So that you're still faced with the problem that as soon as you do any logical virtualization, it's not so easy to keep locality. Um, so you can always say high performance computers, uh, HPC machines, they typically run in the so-called message, message passing interface parallel programming model where the user does the parallelism by hand. And uh, the processes which are the decomposed parts 
send messages through with MPI. And uh, they offer the highest performance on closely coupled problems. So you can actually look at this with C at MapReduce and MPI and look at this hierarchy, map only. That's the pleasingly parallel case. The classic MapReduce, which is done in the basic version of Hadoop, a single map followed by a reduction using disk to communicate between those steps. The use of the disk is fault tolerance but slows down the, uh, the, the system. Iterated map produce is used for data mining, such as uh, the expectation method, maximization methods and clustering. It caches data in memory between iterations and does not write them to disk. And it also supports high performance uh, collective communication, such as reduction, scatter, gather, broadcast, multicast, and so on. Then we have classic MPI, which supports small, Point-to-point -point messages, which you get in simulations. It's typically a rather different message structure for data mining than um, simulations. Simulations tend to have lots of small messages, because you have particles, uh, say, spread around the nodes of a simulation engine, because those are the particles you're simulating. Those particles tend to interact uh, only with a few nearby particles, and those few nearby particles they have to send message to if they're in a different node. And that leads to very many small messages. So what happens, um, what works in clouds? Well, certainly pleasingly parallel, or we can say somewhat more general and pleasingly modestly parallel, and uh, roughly independent data. This clearly supports the long tail of science, which is largely a lot of small jobs. And also the integration of the distributed sensors or more generally the Internet of Things. We're going to discuss IoT a bit later on. We also know that um, things like recommender engines and uh, search algorithms run amazingly well on MapReduce. That's because uh, they're not iterative. Um, and um, however, we know that we can change MapReduce to iterative MapReduce and do other data analytics. <coughs> There are not so many um, great examples of science applications using clouds. There was a nice project from Microsoft uh, funded by the European Union using Azure. And they did 27 applications on clouds. Uh, Future Grid, which is a, probably you could say is a academic cloud, did um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, app, cloud applications, and most of those were from life science. How at least half of them were, not most, but 50% uh, is larger than the fraction of science. I mean, life science is not 50% of all science. I note that locally, the Lilly Corporation is actually a big commercial cloud user. But the um, academic part of, I, of Indiana, namely Purdue and uh, Indiana Biology, I do not think use cloud significantly. And in general, there's not a lot of academic science use of clouds at the moment. Uh, it's not just the technology issue, there's some business issues, because NSF supplies funding to, to users to use certain classes of machines. And that money is not so easy to use on, on Amazon or Azure, which require money as money, not money as uh, an NSF promise to support. So if we look at parallelism, we can do uh, parallelism over users. That's the long tail of science. And we also, um, that's one type of parallelism we can run on clouds. In particle physics and astronomy, particle physics collects events of particles colliding. Astronomy collects images uh, gathered by telescopes, snapping the sky. Uh, these produce a stream of uh, of uh, events or images which go, can be run well on clouds. Um, <clears throat> so in the long tail, a good example of the long tail is uh, genomics and environmental science, uh, which gather in the distributed fashion data. And this data has nicely integrated this analysis on the cloud. And as I mentioned, we can either do the map only version of MapReduce, just running at, um, um, Computations, or we can do map followed by reduction, where the reduction is specifically collecting many jobs together, such in the case of the 
discovery of the, of the and it takes place on analysis. <coughs> we want to be able to um, uh, collect all the events together to plot them in histograms, and that's a typical uh, use of map bridges. And so often reduction is just used to summarize multiple maps, but the main computation is in the maps, and the reduction is a rather quick final step to collect together final results. Um, docking is another example to try to looking at um, uh, which proteins uh, dock into into each other, uh, which chemicals dock into proteins. That's again a pleasingly parallel application running through proteins and, and chemicals. Now we come in the last uh, parts of this um, last half of this uh, lesson to the Internet of Things. And there are various estimates which uh, depend probably on the way they define what the thing is. And they say from 24 to 75 billion devices will be on the Internet by 2020. Uh, most of these will be small sensors. Many of them will actually be in smartphones, because a typical smartphone has, a, I don't know, 10 to 12 sensors. And those sensors, which are measure acceleration and cameras and GPS location, et cetera. They stream information from the sensor into the cloud. And you see that every day you use your smartphone, you're seeing that. And uh, the cloud will not only respond to that particular smartphone, it will actually integrate the data from lots of smartphones to get uh, some global picture of, the, of what's going on, which will help in other types of analysis. And um, so the cloud is a critical controller for the Internet of Things. It also is a resource provider, because when I do a search on my smartphone, I'm going to the cloud to do the search. So we have all sorts of um, ways of representing the fact that the world will be full of tiny computers. Remember I pointed out that Moore's Law said CPUs are getting smaller and smaller. So you can sprinkle them around, smart dust. And you can have intelligent rivers and smart homes and smart grid, ubiquitous cities, the Korean term. And we also expect lots and lots of work on robotics. And some of this uh, Internet of Things will support science. And these things are very naturally parallel. Everything can be processed largely independently in this basic step. And clouds are super suitable for processing things, because clouds love to produce lots of independent things, because the synchronization overheads which clouds have is irrelevant. And also, no, the things themselves are actually a grid. What centralizes the cloud, and that's not necessarily a grid. It could be a grid, but it's not, it, you don't really know what's going on inside a Microsoft or Amazon cloud. But the things are a grid. So you have a sensor grid supported by a a cloud controller. If we look at the use cases, we'll see we have an important characterization of ones that are streaming. And we'll see lots of examples of this. You could, um, a good example is Twitter data. Twitter data streams from users into Twitter. Um, the Actually, the data from smartphones. Um, or the different devices and smartphones streams into the cloud. So there is an important concept of streaming data. And that streaming data is typically pro can be processed with other algorithms. <coughs> and in fact, even people are streaming. Because when I, uh, not only with tweet, but when I just actually uh, do search, I'm streaming my search or I'm streaming my e-commerce transactions. And that's a pretty important. Um, a type of application. And there's a piece of software called Apache Storm that is very critical here to integrate this, um, these different streams together and produce some coherent um, approach to them. Uh, if you can, for instance, find uh, automatic dynamic clustering of twi Twitter uh, streams, tweets in this fashion. Um, and then we need to look at the new algorithms which actually update, say, the cluster, in the case of that Twitter data, update the clusters quickly and produce uh, new clusters or new cluster centers and new cluster properties in a dynamic fashion. Very exciting area. 
streaming data is very, very exciting. And here we have uh, some um, from um, K KPCB, Mika, the standard uh, picture of the growth of um, just now here from 2006 to 2013 of um, these uh, MEMS data, micro electromechanical systems. And uh, notice that um, mobile phones are the largest. Here we are, mobile phones, the blue things, the light blue. Um, then we have media tablets, headsets, laptops, wearables, expected to be a, a huge source. Um, and <clears throat> and some from gaming as well. So anyway, there's a lot. This is the current source of the Internet of Things. We're expecting smartphones, or that which are dominant now, to get competed with by things like the industrial internet, the smart home, the ubiquitous city, and so on. These things which spread um, things around devices around the world, the critical infrastructure of the world, are likely to dominate over smartphones because smartphones are limited by people. And there are lots more places, in the, and people just move around, whereas they to sort of put statically instrumentation things all around the, all around the, our homes and cities and roads and things is likely to happen in a way that um, we haven't quite seen yet and actually that's been predicted to be more important than it is because they just haven't people have not found either the killer application or the killer integration into a convenient application here from business intelligence is a nice plot of the expectation for home devices. Home devices is an area which, again, it was meant to be a very important around 2000. I brought lots of books on the subject, I think a little before that. And I tried to look into home automation, and I did not do anything probably correctly, because that was just not ready to be used. And there's this expectation that uh, this will increase. Google is well known to have bought this company, Nest, which makes smart thermometers and things like that. And that's sort of promising, but it's not really taken off yet. This is my picture pointing out how the clouds controls. Here's the cloud, and here are all your sensors. Here's scientific sensor. Uh, here's a, that sensor might run on an aircraft. Here's a connector, a smartphone, a Lego robot, and a webcam, and they're all feeding into the cloud. And that's what I call sensors as a service. And those sensor processing as a service, which is, I pointed out, done through Storm. <coughs> In this case here, for it's designed for this uh, um, glaciology remote sensing data, which we'll hear about at the end of the end of the course. Um, that's, if you like, sensors as a service is running the software to process the raw data from the sensors in the cloud. Here is another example from Mika, which is self-driving cars that uses deep learning to analyze the results of the images and make decisions on how to drive a car in a very effective fashion. So that's uh, cars are themselves full of hundreds of, every car today is full of hundreds or probably, I don't know how big, it was even hundreds a few years ago, maybe much bigger now. Lots and lots of computers in every car, smart vehicles. Uh, here we have, of course, drones or another. Here's a nice drone, a hexacopter, or I don't know how many uh, things there are there. And uh, those are, uh, and here we have a uh, more conventional drone, aircraft drone, and uh, they're for agriculture, uh, sports and entertainment, and also for search after uh, disasters and tr tr giving immediate first aid uh, response and things like that. So that's a very believed to be a very important area. And we know um, Amazon has suggested that we we'll use drones to deliver, and the FAA is complaining that it, uh, this is all very dangerous, and they have to put a stop to it because it might be progress. We'll have to see what happens. And here we have another example of uh, things which are, I mean, this is actually Apple Pay, which just came out as a good example of this. But every today, we, I use this when I go on the aircraft these days. I just have my uh, boarding code on my smartphone. And I just try, try to avoid my s stupid smartphone uh, 
automatically switching it around so it becomes unusable, but in general it works fine. And um, Starbucks is certainly a well-known place that does this, but lots of people are doing this type of, um, of smartphone related uh, scanning. And you can get information on products and prices, nutrition, and so on. And of course, UPS trucks and things are all automated through this type of scanning. So, this is the Internet of Things, which is going to get more and more important. And I, I already mentioned right at the beginning of this motivation how every GE engine is. Uh, is uh, full of uh, devices and GE claims at least a couple of years ago to generate about 10 times as much data as Twitter does every day from the things inside their engines which are going to which allow them to do better maintenance and so on and so on so this is all uh, pretty exciting